Hello, Culture Matters Podcast. Today, I'm very excited to introduce you to our guest. But before that, remember, we believe here at Culture Matters when people read to think, write to develop, listen to hear what is unsaid, and speak to let go, they develop more value for themselves and others. So our purpose of this podcast is to uncover the genius of our guest with the goal to make you, the listener, your curiosity cool. Because our vision is that human culture is open, curious and focused on creating the future. So our mission is to read, write, listen, and speak every single day. Today, I'm very excited to introduce you to our guest, Bill Mervin and the Bill Mervin Mortgage Team. Over a decade and a half plus years as an advisor in the mortgage industry, helping people achieve the American gift every single day. He's a dear friend of mine, super smart guy. Episode 88, season eight of the Culture Matters Podcast. He's been on the show before, so check that episode out. Today, we're going to dive into a million different topics. Bill, before we do that, we have a quote that we're going to do together, change it up today. You, uh, why don't you kick that off, my friend? Let's do it. Uh, about credit default swaps. Let me put it this way. I'm standing in front of a burning house, and I'm offering you fire insurance on it. Saints, don't live on Park Avenue. Saints, don't live on Park Avenue. Vinny Daniel, how are you fucking us? Jared Ventner, when you come for payday, I'm going to rip your eyes out. I'm going to make I'm going to make a fortune. The good news is, Vinny, you're not going to care because you're not you're going to make so much money. That's why I. that's what I get out of it. You want to know what you get out of it? You get the ice cream, the hot fudge, the banana and the nuts. Right now, I get the sprinkles. And yeah, if this goes through, I get the cherry. But you get the Sunday, Vinny. You get the Sunday. All right. I buy that. Thank you. <laughs> In the years that followed, hundreds of bankers and rating agencies and executives went to jail. The SEC was completely overhauled. The Congress had no choice but to break up the big banks and regulate the mortgage and derivatives industry. Just kidding. Banks took the money the American people gave them and used it to pay themselves huge bonuses and the lobby the Congress uh, to kill big reform. And then they blame the immigrants and poor people. And this time, even teachers. And when all was said and done, only one single, not even only one single, only one single banker went to jail, this poor schmuck. <laughs> and my, our listeners, that is a quote from the big short, just so you, you know, that's not Bill saying all that. <laughs> <laughs> You're a good sport, brother. I, I was trying to signal it to you because I, I was going to read all that stuff, but the uh, we didn't say the last name of Jared in the beginning. So thanks for being a good sport with nah, that okay. on the Culture Matters podcast. My first question, great job. My first question is, what are you thinking today, March 13th, 2023? Is this because some people listening may not be in the industry, they don't know what's going on macro. Is this a 2008 time or is that just, you know, is it similar? Is it different? What are your thoughts? I should people be freaking out? What, what do you what do you think? Should I not buy a house right now? I got a million uh, questions. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I mean, you know. It's funny. You've heard this from me before, Jay, and uh, I, I think it applies here, right? That, you know, I'll tell people when I'm having discussions with them about rates and, you know, I actually use it as a context to to kind of say that while nobody knows what's going to happen, of course, we can look at the data and we can try to make, you know, educated, you know, informed choices about what what might happen. Or as you shared with me again recently, you know, history uh what is it it doesn't uh, it often rhymes whatever the saying mm. goes but long story short uh one of the things i say to my clients is you know if anybody's telling you they know what rates are going to do or they know what uh they know what stocks are going to do run away because they should be trading options on a yacht somewhere and not not uh here talking to you but um so i don't know right we're still super early into this um i mean geez it was five days ago um you know rates had just gone up an incredible amount throughout uh throughout february um you know rates were coming down the market was prepared for uh, an earlier fed pivot as we started to get the uh, disinflation theme started to take hold uh in you know the late part of 2022 and through january and then we got a blowout uh, jobs report 500,000 jobs wage pressures 
um, PCE, which is like the new, you know, favorite uh, gauge of inflation for the Fed, uh, came out hot. So it looked like it could be reaccelerating. Um, and the markets felt like they got out ahead of the Fed pivot and and the Feds were, you know, beating the drums and pounding their chest and talking about a higher terminal rate, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, that and, and really the idea was that, you know, despite all of the squawking, if you will, from Wall Street, that, um, you know, that uh, the Fed hadn't broken anything. Right. And that, uh, you know, the economy was still running really hot and creating a lot of jobs and and, um, you know, had had a lot of room to go. Um, then, you know, then then Friday came and, um, you know, uh, SVB, uh, of course, was taken over by the uh, FDIC. Um, and, you know, the question is, was this, um, I think you and I chatted about this briefly last night, was this, you know, an isolated incident with a poorly managed bank that was overly concentrated in, um, you know, in, 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 in tech, right, which is, has been taking a beating lately, you know, or is this the canary in the coal mine, right? Is this, did the Fed uh, overdo it? by um, you know missing the mark so badly on inflation and the whole transitory theme from 2021 and did you know this this rapid you know rate of increase that they had to do in the last you know year is it breaking things right because you know so many financial institutions hold um, hold debt uh, hold government debt and um, of course, when the yields rise, the I'm sure most of your listeners know this stuff. But when you, yields rise, right? If if the current rate, uh, just just for those that aren't as familiar, right? The price and the um, yield on debt move inverse of one another. So you know, if I have debt that's at two percent, and uh, let's see, a ten year government bond, and 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 the current government bonds are going for six percent. Then who the hell wants my two percent government debt? So the value of that mm. debt is significantly reduced. Um, and so um, you know this massive rise and rapid rise of interest rates has you know um, just crushed the value of of of, of bonds generally speaking. Um, and so that has really hurt um, you know the balance sheets of a lot of the the institutions that hold this stuff. And then additionally, when, well, I'd have to look as of today, but as of last week, you could get basically 5%, which it's a whole separate discussion on whether gov U.S. government debt is truly risk-free, but we'll consider for the now the, the general consensus that U.S. bonds are, are, are risk-free. Um, and you could get a one-year um, uh, treasury bill for, for 5%. So to get essentially 5% risk-free, um, that was putting further um, strain on deposits, right? Because why would I leave the money in the bank with you when I can, mm. you know, park it with the U.S. U.S. government for a year for five percent? So, um, so there's been a lot of pressure. And so the question is: is that did is, is this really? Is it really that theme of a uh, again, miss you know, overly uh, you know, bank that's um, didn't have good diversification? Um, and uh, took made some risky bets, was poorly managed, um, and it's isolated. Or, or was it? Uh, is this the first sign that something is is broken? Right? And are there more? Or are there more um, bodies to 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 come up? Um, Can we unpack both scenarios? Yeah, let's, and how you think that relates to someone listening to this that may practically be thinking: Should I buy a house, or should I not buy a house, or? No, sure. buy that investment property or not buy that. So how can we explore both sides, right? Let's let's say start with the, whichever comes to your to your head first. Like you know, things exploding or things not. Uh, I think that my guess, my guess uh, is that the the truth is 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 in the middle somewhere. I don't see this to be back to the original question. I don't see, I don't really see anything that's analogous to two thousand and eight in my opinion, at this time, just, um, you know, while I am generally a contrarian, I do believe that overall, the financial system is in better shape. I do think that, you know, banks are overall better capitalized, um, uh, specific to housing, which of course, you know, is near and dear to my heart. Although I know we're kind of taking a little more, you know, broader than that. 
Um, I mean, I, I constantly talk about the fact that there's nothing like it today, like there is in 2008. I mean, to, to just take that since we've got some time and unpack that. I mean, in 2008, which I was around 2006 to eight, let's call it. Um, you had nationally around 4 million homes on the market. Today, you've got about a million homes on the market. Um, you know, normal supply and demand in economics tells you that when prices are up and there's not enough of something, you build or make more of that thing and then take advantage of those uh, distortions and, and, and those higher prices. And then, you know, an equilibrium is reached. But the problem is with whether it's not as much space in the areas that most people are, whether it's the regulations and the difficulties of getting new building projects done in some cases, um, and or in particularly here in the Northeast, or whether it's um, the cost of labor and material with all the inflation that we've seen in those areas, it's very challenging to build homes and, and make money on them to make up for that demand. I would argue, I don't know, this is more anecdotal, but the reason you see more um, new construction at the higher price points um, is simply just because there's just more margin there to 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 kind of um, compensate and you know and and that I don't want to use the word class but that segment of the buying population has probably done better during the last couple of years than than middle America if you will so um, so 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 in short the supply and demand the normal supply and demand mode. Are, are a little bit broken right now. So I don't see, as I've been like to saying it, I don't think the Calvary is on the way, so to speak, with new supply. Um, you've additionally got on the demand side, you've got, um, I think, around 12 million more housing formations today than there was back then. So less supply, more demand. Additionally, the age that is the, um, I guess, the median um, first time buyer which is 33 it was pretty much the smallest generation since um in 2006 since like the 1920s i believe oh. and the generation that's 33 today uh rivals the baby boomers it's a little smaller than the baby boomers but it rivals it and in fact that 33 year old age segment actually increases for the next five years in a row after this year um, so you've got uh, less supply, not enough supply to really make up for the difference, um, and a lot more demand. Um, and then additionally, you can layer that with the fact that you had um, a ton of what we call product risk back then. Who would have thought that if you gave people two-year adjustable interest rates with three-year prepayment penalties with zero money down that there could yeah. have been problems? Uh, back in 2006, but those products are pretty much phased out. Um, so you don't have that same product risk. In fact, lending standards are tighter now than they've been in a long time. Um, and then uh, finally, you have um, the equity position of most Americans. The Americans have more equity in their houses than any other time in history. Um, and part of the effect that we felt in 2006 and 2008 uh, was related to there not being that, the, the kind of, we didn't have the same run-up in prices we had. We had a lot more smaller down payment loans, and um, which is interesting. We can get into, I get a question about first-time buyer programs a lot and uh, the role that the government might have had in in, uh, huh. in incentivizing 2006 through 2008, but um, I digress. Yeah, so we've got all this equity, right? And so part of the what the part of what happened, right? Of course, if you get in financial trouble and you're forced to sell, if you don't have the equity to sell, or in the mortgage or real estate terms, you're upside down, meaning either the home is worth less than you owe, or the home effective price of the home after your closing costs is less worth than you than you owe, then you don't. The only choice you have is to default, right? And then you go to share of sale, which typically most people aren't going to take as good a care of their home before they foreclose, right? It's going to be. Does it go to default yeah. even if you're paying the monthly? No, I'm talking about people that get in, find themselves in financial trouble because there's always going to be a Understood. segment of people who who that happens to. Um, and if they find themselves in financial trouble and they don't have the equity to sell, they're going to default, right? And when they default, some of them are not going to take great care of their homes. Um, and regardless whether they do or they don't, 
you know, things that are sold at a sheriff sale are typically going to sell at a discount. And when those things sell at a discount, now it suppresses the value of other homes in the area. And when it suppresses the value of other homes in the area, it increases the percentage of people that are, quote, upside down or effectively upside down. And it becomes a, a self, self-fueling spiral. Um, and right ha- what now, right now, not that people don't find themselves in financial straits, but if you find yourself in financial straits and you're sitting on $100,000 of equity in your home, you're going to put it on the market, sell it to any number of buyers that are looking to buy it. You're going to take your hundred grand, you're going to lick your wounds and you're going to live to fight another day. Mm. Um, and you don't have that same, those same forces at play. So I would say broadly speaking, um, there's no similarities in my opinion between today and 2008. And so for that reason, it might seem like the canned answer for somebody in my field, but I truly believe that, you know, it's still a, a great time to buy. Um, I think that when you hear people saying about home prices declining, you and I had this conversation recently that I think it, you know, real estate's always been hyper local. And I think that that, you know, I think the San Francisco's and the Austin's and the DC's of the world um, get sucked into that conversation. But I'd say through most of America, home prices are, are stabilized. You know, the, there's disinflation within home prices um, and, and pr- homes that were overpriced are resetting to market. But I don't really see a case for um, decline in home prices in most markets. Um, and yet I think that there's just a bit of actually a buying opportunity right now, just because of the affordability issue with higher rates. There's a, some segment of the population that isn't qualified at the homes they wanna buy at these rates. And there's a certain segment of people who are listening to, no offense, Yahoo Finance, listening to Yahoo Finance for their news and saying, oh, no, I'm gonna wait for rates to drop. I'll wait for home prices to drop. And therefore, um, are, are, are sitting out. So the, de- the demand is a little bit lower at this time. And so for that reason, I actually think it's a good buying opportunity. And that's because? Because I think that fundamentally that entire picture that I just painted is, is there. And so therefore I think that's extremely supportive of real estate into the, the mid and short term. Um, and I think that the only factor that's changed from six to 12 months ago when every house seemed to have 20 offers on it and go for over ask and people offering a free week vacation to get their offer accepted. The only thing that has changed is interest rates and quote, you know, perceived affordability. And I think that when rates drop, all of those people will still need homes and they'll come off of the sidelines. And I think that we'll find ourselves back, you know, in that frothiness and lots of bidding wars and things like that. And is the idea behind that, that that ends up increasing the house price? Oh yeah. I mean, yeah, it's just supply and demand. If you've got a lot of same amount of houses and you got more people buying and bidding on them, it's going to increase, increase the price of homes. So I I think that, um, and then you'd ask yourself, okay, well, when does it, when does the affordability break? But you know, rent's not a, renting is not a, you have the same issues on vacancy, right? Like vacancy is at near an all-time low. So, you know, where, where are you going to go? You got to go somewhere. So, um, so yes, I think that, I think that, you know, home prices will continue their bid, um, even, you know, like they were before, uh, when, when we see interest rates drop. Yeah. Do you see that people put more money down now than in 2006? Let's not understand that more clearly when they're buying homes. Is that part of what you were saying or what that generally, what's that look like? Uh, I mean, I guess it's, it's, I, I can't say that I know the data in and out of what the average down payment is now versus then. Um, I can tell. And, and even and just you, anecdotally, you know, like you're out there talking to people all the time. Well, this was kind of my, this was my point is, is that there was um, through the So for those we talked, I know you and I talked about maybe talk touching on a little bit of, you know, different type of economic models and all. And there's a very interesting speech that uh, Ron Paul did on the floor of the house, I think somewhere time between 2001 and 2003. And, you know, it was around the time that, you know, they were creating the mandate for the GSEs, the government sponsored entities. 
Um, mm. and, and I'll tell you, Bush was a big part of this, of like wanting to tout home ownership percentages within the country. And they basically said, you know, okay, you're gonna, uh, we want, you know, to increase home ownership and, um, you know, we want to create these entities to be supportive of it. And, um, you know, I liken it to like, uh, and he said, he basically said, look at what you're going to do is you're going to, um, distort the markets. I'm summarizing here. I'm, I'm paraphrasing here from how I remember it, but you're going to distort the markets. You're going to attract a whole bunch of capital to the real estate market that wouldn't otherwise be attracted to it. Oh. You're going to inflate home prices. It's going to come crashing down. And when it comes crashing back down, the taxpayer is going to get left holding the bag like they always do. That's kind of the summary of what he said. And this was like five And years. is the idea behind that if you loosen, if theoretically one loosens up the, the the regulation or the restriction or the opportunity, more people, more consumers have a shot, whether that makes sense or not, psychologically or whatever, and more money comes in and that could be with a different philosophy of, of or something or a different, like two different groups of people are coming in, is it consumers and also lenders or lending type, in, well, yeah. So, yes, you could. I guess you could say it in two ways. So, we could talk about the specific programs, and that'll tie into your question about down payment. But more broadly, um, again, for those that aren't familiar, um, the what really has it, it used to be back in the day that loans were portfolio loans, right? So, I walk into my bank. This is the old, you know, or at least what I have in my head of like, you know, you walk in and you got your loan officers sitting at the bank and you know, they're like, oh yeah, you know, Joe's family, they've lived here for 20 years, got a great business over there, you know, like uh, we feel comfortable with him. We're going to make a loan. And they make a loan and then you keep that loan until you pay it off. And that, that company holds that loan, um, so to speak, on their books One until company. it's, yeah, until it's paid off, right? So today you would call that a portfolio loan because the bank keeps it in their portfolio. Um, but They're accountable for that debt. Yeah, they're accountable for that debt. And then you have to think, but from like an economic standpoint, you got to think about opportunity cost, right? Like there's only so much money that we can have on the street at any given time. Um, so the government sponsored entities, which now are really just government entities since they've been um, taken over during 2008. Um, it, they basically were created as like these quasi private industry, uh, quasi private institutions meant to help uh, provide liquidity to the housing market. And they, the people take their loans that they make and they package those loans up. The GSEs, I may be oversimplifying a bit, but the GSEs um, then create bonds out of them, right? A package of a bunch of debt, securitized debt. They create bonds of them and then institutions all over the world who need debt right like insurance companies and um and and pension funds buy that debt as a stream of income and the idea is is that then it's spread out across that whole um it reduces the risk to the investor um and then by recapitalizing the individuals who made those loans they are then free to go out and make more loans and therefore lubricating the housing industry, if you will. Um, and the, oh boy, the government basically gave a, I always get the, not always, I get these mixed up, uh, an implicit backing of those government bonds through Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Um, they basically said, that's us, right? Like we're going to, we're going to back that if it ever goes bad, right? It's just what they did in 2006 and 2008. Um, and so the way I, I try to use analogies sometimes to make a point, right? And it's like, if you had a guy that was, you know, a billionaire, right? And he had a whole bunch of history of running a bunch of successful businesses. And he said, um, you know, loan me money and I'll pay you 4%. And then he said, you know, here's my nephew, right? He wants to get this business off the ground. 
right? He's going to make a bunch of loans to people with 0% down and with limited income verification and et cetera, et cetera. And I'm going to pay, he's going to pay you 5%, but if he doesn't pay you, I'll pay you, right? So you can get 4% and lend to the billionaire. You can get 5% and lend to the billionaire's nephew who the billionaire said he's going to backstop if, the, if he doesn't pay, right? That's that misallocation of capital. If you told people you're going to come in and you were going to, you know, you were going to make a bunch of loans to a bunch of people with, I mean, there was in 2006, there was loans you could get with somebody that was currently 90 days late on a mortgage to get a new mortgage. Who would have thought that that could have gone wrong, right? And yet these were all packaged up. Now, not that those were backed by Fannie Freddie. That was just subprime securitization. That's a whole separate thing. But the point is, is that all these loans were trash, right? And so ultimately it allocated a bunch of capital to the housing market, just as Rand, well, Ron Paul stated at that time, that would not have come in without the US government standing behind and says, we're gonna back this debt, but we're gonna back it at a premium if you lend it directly to us, but we're gonna back it anyway. So it's kind of like- Theoretically, that. aren't if even if the government backs it, they're backing it with the citizens' money. Of oh, course, cool. well, it's all the citizens' money. <laughs> No, I just, you know, by the way, really well explained to lay person. I mean, I'm just like, from a cultural perspective, I never heard it this way. And it's like kind of a Christmas tree of thoughts right now, <laughs> how that could easily become a cultural issue. Yeah, you wonder if it could. Did you think like the, the threshold of somebody theoretically, you know, going through whatever to become a, a more, let's say, help. To become a mortgage lender, they may not think it's that big of a deal to pass the buck because, you know, life experiences and things. It's not like, you know, when you have 12 years of schooling to work on a brain, by then you t you're at a certain point where you, you're looking at that brain differently than one year of schooling. And, and it's just a thought that came to my mind. So I'm sorry, I, I interrupted this. No articulated breakdown. What what are we missing here, though? There's well, just so more. as it relates specifically to the down payment, because that's how I kind of got on this this little sidetrack was, um, you know, so like people today will ask me like, oh, about down payment. So, you know, first time buyer, what do I get as a first time buyer? And there are some programs. Wait, Bill, this was this is the question I want to add to that. But the, wait, real, I'm sorry, yeah. real quick, going back to what you explained, everything you just explained that kind of. It, seem to implode in the 2008. Um, all of that is still the same today, correct? It's just there's more regulations. Meaning uh, that whole methodology of a loan is maybe, uh, 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 someone, you go to the bank, you get a loan, they don't keep it on their books like they used to. Generally, they sell to someone else. Yeah, that's and, there. And the securitization is there. Yeah, that's and 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 generally speaking, I don't have an issue with the securitization. Um, in that, uh, you know, it, it does make logical sense, right? In that, in that, that at any given time, that there's uh, there's individuals who want to, like, for example, we don't want to be a servicing company, right? We want to. I think what makes us good at being a, an origination company, being experts, giving guidance, make sure that we're structuring loans properly, executing on the front end. Um, I think that, you know, we don't have a bunch of people sitting around cubes and we don't spend billions of dollars to have payment processing, you know, technology, right? And because we don't want to be everything to all people. So when I look at it in the company and the structure that we have, I really just look at it like we're outsourcing the servicing of those payments, that collection of the payment and that securitization side of the business. And then we just want to get the money that we've earned for what we've originated. Now, my team still manages in that kind of advisory role. So I tell people, look, no matter who's collecting your payment, we're the people you come to when you navigate, whether you want to keep this house and, and go buy an investment property, or we're taking a look at a funding need, like sending our kids to college and whether one of the possible solutions is using a little bit of equity in our home. Like we're still there for that. Um, but as it relates to everything that happens on the back end, we don't want to do that or be that person, right? We want to get the but in money. in the past, that was the only way it worked. 
That was the only way it worked. So my it's point is, is that the world's evolved and decentralized. There's more separate parties involved in this process. And could that have created a space for people to be entitled and to be selfish? Well, clearly, yeah. And in fact, it wasn't just, it didn't just- But it wasn't just space. that. It would be the, the, the this, this, this whole sentiment you're saying of things loosening up at one point where people may have been getting- yeah so opportunities to own assets so was like, i don't know how so. yeah how far down the rabbit hole we want to go but i would there was securitization happening with the government sponsored entities and then there was also securitization happening with subprime mortgages right mortgages that were even which at the time the government sponsored entities um you know standards were lower right and i'll get into that in a minute of of like the fact that they were not just given the space, but they were incentivized, or I would I'd say more, I don't want to misrepresent it. They were mandated to kind of expand their risk portfolio, right? They were given a mandate to increase home ownership, to increase home ownership within certain communities, right? Um, and so they almost were forced to find ways to get creative to um, that's my take, right? To 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 find ways to make more loans to people. Culture, and then, like, and yes, yes, and you know there was that was big. I remember, I forget the numbers, but you know, even it was Bush. It was talking about you know the highest home ownership percentage, you know, at, at any time in history. Um, and then you know, two thousand six, two thousand eight comes along and says maybe not everybody deserves a home, right? Or isn't a that's a strong word. I'm sure I'll get some flack somewhere for that, but. Maybe it's not some everybody deserves to be able to finance a home or is in a position currently to be able to do so. And maybe trying to find ways to manufacture that is not the best idea. Um, it's probably more uh, succinct. Um, and so so then you had you had these subprime loans, which is then you took this really, when I described the 0% down and all that low income document, that was not the, 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 the government sponsored entities, but they were following that same practice. They thought that if you just took... And that's really what they're talking about in that in that um, clip or that that thing that we uh, read. Yeah, we should probably explain that to people that haven't seen that movie. Yeah, well, so th that actually, so to right at the heart of what I'm talking about right now is they securitized a bunch of crap. I'm just going to use the word crap. They took crap and they said, if I take, you know, some crap here and some crap here and some crap here and I bunch it all together and all of a sudden somehow that crap magically becomes uh, a- Gold. Uh, investment grade bond, right? And the whole world basically built their entire models and bought into this. And then the credit ratings agencies came along, put their official stamp on it. And everybody said the, uh, you know, the Federal Reserve, the ones that are leading the ship right now in this current situation said, oh, this is contained to the subprime sector of the, uh, of the market. It's uh, everything else is in great shape. And essentially those people at that time, there were some folks that thought that this was crazy and thought that Saul, I guess the emperor had no clothes and credit default swaps are something that pays you out if, if, if debt goes bad, right? So they insure something. And then if it goes bankrupt or, 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 you know, basically um, implodes like it did, it pays out. And, and that's when his, when he says, you're standing in front of a burning building and I'm selling you fire insurance. That's what he's talking about. Like this stuff's already happening. These things are already, you know, already at the time they hadn't gone bad, but about to go bad. And it was, the damage was done. And, um, and that's what he's talking about there. Um, and some people made, uh, made out very handsomely a few contrarians during that time. So um, what does it mean potentially if thing if the bank banks i guess it's plural now as of this weekend two two banks are, are under or at least one well, let's if that's the canary in the coal mine or is that yeah yeah that's going to be spreading in that hypothetical scenario what could that mean for the the person listening to this that is in a home and has a certain rate or may be buying a home. Like what, what I'm just curious about di the, the different hypotheticals, right? You, you, you eloquently broke down. So we're talking about, we're bank. talking about home ownership or either current or. or yeah. Yeah. So I think if I, garner, 
if I get, if I'm, if I'm following where we're at so far, we're, we're unpacking the, some of the uh, variables before the, the actual 2008, you're saying you don't see, see that scenario. Um, and so I think you made a pretty strong argument, or at least my take for someone listening to this, this is a pretty solid time to buy if they're in a position where they can do that. What about the other hypothetical? Let's say that this, what's this SVB bank called? SVB, SVB Silicon Valley Bank. Silicon Valley Bank. So let's say that it is the beginning of a mass. And Signature Bank was the other one. But yeah, let, let's say that they're not abnormalities and they're reflective hypothetically of the Federal Reserve pushing it a bit too much and, 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 and compressing margins of like many banks. And, and having the kind of so like then what 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 could that lead what could that mean is that affect people's incomes and we, like jobs I don't well, want to this is an for you. well yeah curious. well uh, yeah, 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 yeah. well that's it's yeah I mean that's why well, I devil's specific. advocate I mean that's why I was digging into you know the uh, the what we were focusing on I mean the impacts of that could could reverberate in so many different areas. So if we're staying along the line of housing at the moment, right? Um, and we could broaden it out from there if you'd like. But if we're staying in the line of housing, um, so first of all, we saw it. I mean, we had a massive bond rally today. So, um, and Friday and into today. All, um, and so as it plays out in my particular space uh, in, and with interest rates, um, if if that scenario plays out, interest rates will will improve drastically and quickly um, for two reasons. The first reason being uh, the Fed pivot that we were talking about earlier, right? Which is, I mean, again, I don't want to get on a ton of ton of rabbit trails. I can do that, but you know, if if it, it, the Fed doesn't raise interest rates, let's just start there. Hopefully, everybody listening knows that. But if not, that's okay. Fed doesn't control mortgage rates. Fed controls the short-term rate and they use it as a regulator for the economy. Mortgage rates, long-term interest rates are all market-driven. And so it isn't that the Fed raised rates, it's that inflation took off, interest rates rose to deal with that inflation, and then the Fed raised their short-term rate that they control in order to try to kill inflation, right? If I give you long-term debt at 4%, and everything is rising and everything is costing 8% or more a year, I'm losing my tail on that debt. I have to charge more in order to compensate for inflation. So inflation is the enemy of bonds, the enemy of interest rates. So when it became apparent that um, it, the, the trans, you know, inflation is transitory story was, was bull um, and the Fed had totally you know, missed the mark again, um, that was this massive resetting of rates over the past year. So the Fed um, raises their interest rate in order to demand destruction, to kill demand. They won't admit it, and they keep talking about a soft landing. But I think if anybody is being honest with themselves, and certainly my opinion is, is that you don't cool down what essentially was 10% double-digit inflation without bringing the economy to its knees, without forcing us into an inflation, the boom and bust cycle, Right. Because it's nothing, you know, the only way to bring it down is to bring down the demand for things and to people are out of jobs and people feel less wealthy and they spend less money and it cools inflation down that way. So the Fed has stomped on interest rates in order to kill demand, in order to bring down inflation. Um, and that's been this tug of war since like, I don't know, maybe the summertime sometime and throughout the fall and into the last winter is... Um, when the markets are fighting and jockeying for a position on what we call the Fed pivot, right? Which is in, in financial terms, they call it the terminal interest rate. Terminal interest rate is the maximum rate that they reach on a cycle before they, on a, on a, on a given cycle, right? So on a rate increasing cycle. And I think today, if I recall, we're between four and a half and four, seven, five on the current Fed funds rate. Um, and so that's the big battle. Every time the market feels like enough damage has been done that the Fed is going to begin to pivot and go the other direction, the markets rally and they get excited because they think that we're going to get a return to easy money. 
Um, and then when the markets rally, then the Fed guys come up, either some data comes out or the Fed speaks or some combination of both and says, yo, you guys are getting ahead of yourself here. We've got a long way to go here on this rate increase cycle. And then the market goes swinging back the other way and says, well, we got out ahead of this one too early. And there's been this wrestling match. It's an incredible wrestling match going on for the last six to nine months uh, about that. Um, and so um, the the expectations for the March meeting of the Fed was for it to get, it went from 25 basis points the market was expecting to 50 basis points when the last two data points came out, the jobs report and that PCE report. And then just from Friday to today, it went, I believe the last I checked, although it could have changed two more times before the day was out, to Goldman, for example, calling for no rate increase in the March. Mm -hmm. So my point in saying all that is, is that if that is, if this is going to fold into something larger, then not only would the Fed not potentially continue to increase for the next six to nine months, they could stop and they could start cutting again later this year, which would be very supportive of interest rates. Um, the other phenomenon much quicker is that um, more broadly speaking, things that would be considered, quote, bad in the world are good for interest rates. So you have um, risk on, risk off. You've got um, generally assets move into certain classes when people are feeling good about things and feeling like taking risk, and they move into other asset classes when they're feeling stressed or worried and, and, and the, you know, a flight to safety, as they call it. So when you have turbulence, people buy, sell the things that they perceive to be more risky and they buy things that they perceive to be more, more, more safe um, and government debt being perceived to be the most safe. Um, and so that's the other phenomenon that's going on is generally if things get shaken, people will sell stocks, buy bonds. And as we said earlier, if, people, if more people want to buy a fixed income asset, then you can afford to give a lower rate of interest and people will still want to buy it because of the high demand. And so that pushes yields down as well. So that would be very supportive of, of lower interest rates if it does, the, if, if the cards, um, if this thing unwinds further, specific to that. Could there be any reason at all whatsoever that the rate, that the Fed would continue to raise interest rates? So... I don't think they have the backbone. That's just me. Um, and now that would go into the second, the well, I guess the, the former scenario, which is the other view that could be taken here is that everything that was in place before this short-term scare is still there. That we had the 70s where inflation would start to cool and then it would reaccelerate, right? And that you've got these structural um, issues in the job market that are not fixing themselves. That um, and that um, that is going to keep pressure on wage inflation which is the scariest type of inflation, at least the Fed believes, what you call the wage price spiral, right? People have pricing power or wage, you know, you know, can demand higher wages. And then the prices of things rise to pay those higher wages. And then those people demand higher wages in order to pay for the more expensive mm -hmm. stuff and so on. So that was the fear. And that's why the Fed has been so adamant about killing inflation this round, because it was starting to bleed into other things. And if you feel that the Fed and the FDIC and the various government entities uh, that came together to backstop this thing have done enough and will do enough, then you start to not worry about the systemic risk. So if they've done enough that the Fed still feels that they can move forward with fighting inflation and finishing out this rate tightening cycle, then you could see a very sharp reversal and you could see higher rates very quickly. And how much, you know, do you think people generally forget the ideological side of things? Like there's. Which side? You know, like the side about the moral either, hazard? Or what what side? I, I guess like the, 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 you know, 
philosophically, politically, that there's different views of how the world works. So couldn't there be like theoretically a likelihood that rates just continue to go up because ideologically that's the theory that underlines the, like, I mean, if I'm looking at, you know, just just a curiosity, if, if the same people that said it's transitory and when it wasn't, well, what, what would make them think it's transitory? Maybe this, whatever theories that there are undergirding their assumptions and their conjectures could, I mean, I wouldn't think that they would just change their philosophy or change their theories. And so, I don't know, I, 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 well, you know, I how much you know, of that could be an impact that, that, that catches people? Like, are we often sometimes too rational in these conversations? I mean, I, I I feel like the default is always going to be to what is the path of least resistance today. I think in most cases, um, Volcker wasn't like that. I suppose um, in the in in his era, um, and dealt with some serious pain. But I just I say that to 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 say that it seems like if you if you bring the economy to its knees now right that's much more painful and le much less it's it's politically um unacceptable um and um and so it just seems like nobody wants to deal with that right the the argument of the you know austrian type folks and more of the you know sound money type folks is is that you know you just continue to you know, you're just a drug addict on a, on a, on a binge and just doesn't want to pay the piper. Right. And so, um, you know, whereas the idea that if we continue to always loosen monetary policy, every time we find ourselves in trouble that, yeah, we have to deal with the pain now, but you know, it's going to be a lot worse one day when we finally do have to pay that bill. Um, you know, there's a lot of folks that said that after all the spending we did in 2006 and the people that argue the side that it is the right thing to do say, well, yeah, that never came to, that never came to be. Now, the people that believe that you need to do that and you need to pay the piper and not continue to be addicted to cheap money say, no, all you did was just delay it further and nobody's going to know until they know. Mm -hmm. So since nobody's going to know until they know, I feel like we're in a frame right now where the side of dealing with less pain today is, is still, is still going to win out. So I just don't know that we've become, I mean, there was a time where going interest rates to zero was just unheard of. What do we do when we got to zero? I mean, for the, I'm sure maybe a lot of your people know what quantitative easing is. It's effectively less than zero, right? We didn't just raise the interest. We didn't just lower the interest rates to zero, but now we're printing and monetizing debt to effectively increase the money supply even more than we can by just lowering interest rates to zero. And European nations brought to negative interest rates. You had to pay money in order to park your money, park your money at the bank. So what does that say? It says, no, they want every single penny out flowing through the economy. And so my point is, is that I think we've just become addicted to this stuff. Um, and so, I guess your question at the beginning was, how do we know that they're going to not just stay the course and do the hard, make the hard decision? And if inflation was a problem before, it's still a problem and, and, uh, and, and just stay the course. I mean, I don't know that for sure, but I think certainly the last um, 20 plus years, of, it seems like this is actually catching hold more, this easy money kind of philosophy and, and, uh, and and not and not less. Um, you think the gig economy has anything to do with this culturally? Like people, hmm. people work more than they ever did without feeling like they worked. So I never met an Uber driver that wasn't more successful than me. That's kind of a joke. Meaning I'm getting driven to wherever. <laughs> <laughs> and the person is just telling me how many businesses they have. And, and Hey, I feel good about people that, that, that are striving like, and all that, but the Uber driver, almost every time I get a, a, and this doesn't happen when I'm in a professional service car, but every time I'm in a Lyft and Uber, the, the driver, 
you know, they're driving Uber because, and I'm trying, I don't want to offend anybody that um, drives that. That's not my intention, but I haven't met any, I'm, you know, there's some hustlers out there. The way Everybody. you said it, I think the way so, you so said it. Like people are working more than they've ever worked and not aware of that they're working more than they're like by and large. So I wonder how much, how, what level of factors, like there's gotta be some variables in economics today that obviously weren't variables 20 years ago as a reflection of the technological advancement, the cultural, uh, you know, re, re, reinterpretation of that. But like, I, w I wonder how much of an effect that has you know, like people ha may have more money than they appear to or, and they're where they're, I'm just curious of your thoughts on all this, like where are, how we're viewing ourselves and, you know, through, through these, through the phones and through these platforms and through these alternate realities of what our life should be or could be and what that does to our spending habits and what that does to our cash flow. Like the average person that may have been a median income of 40,000 at one time may have a median income of 80,000 today because of the gig economy. Like they have a full-time job making 40 grand and then they make an extra thousand a week driving people like anyone listening to this somewhere around in Uber. Or, and then they also may be using Uber, right? They have a car and they're, they're also using Uber and they drive Uber. So, so like you, that's just an example, like the Ubers. I don't know. What are your thoughts on on that? You think uh, on just it's a random thought that came to me the last you know we have a few minutes here we have. What what are your thoughts on that? Well, I definitely have spent some time thinking about like what has changed. I mean, I think that I was just shocked during COVID um, at the number of places that didn't have workers, right? And I know that we were dealing with whatever we were dealing with at that time. And so people were sick or people were out of work or people were being cautious. But as we seemingly emerged from that, it was like, it never went away. And um, so I, it, it was just for me, and I feel like there's others that experienced it. It was just this very strange feeling of like, what happened? Like what happened in the last two years Right. That like, you know, Starbucks is having to shut down early some days because they don't have enough people to work. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's really, um, you know, where I don't want to say entry level even, but just, you know, those types of service jobs is where they're having the most um, the most the most pressure. Now, you know, I think I think you're I don't know if it's your thesis or just kind of something you're kind of postulating but like you, the idea that a lot of people are taking advantage of these gig economies uh, get these gig jobs um and that's keeping them from you know doing your normal uh quote unquote normal you know entry level positions that's that's one thing i mean you could you know i think you could make the art i mean certainly certainly um Certainly, no, I want to clarify. Yeah. I'm thinking a lot of people that have jobs are also doing. Well, they have the opportunity to to work on the gig in the gig economy, whether that's an online business, whether that's driving Lyft, whether that's OnlyFans, whether that's and I I'm serious. I mean, you know, whatever that is. Yeah. Like I wonder what impact that ha that's having on the. That's interesting. I had her, I was thinking of it more like, I definitely feel like, I mean, it was my own biases. I feel like there's a lot of, and I'm sure my parents' generation thought this of me, but I feel like there's a lot of people out there that don't want to work or they, so I think you might've been saying it in a different context or, or. Well, they just may not want to work for jerks. Well, sure. I, I believe that. <laughs> no, that's, that's very true. You know, and actually come to think of it, I think that I think that is a big, I think there's a major, a major. Um... Like if they're right in our society is becoming more solipsistic or self-centered, narcissistic, kind of like self-centered. Yeah. Staring through the phone. What, the, what do they want? They want, we, what are they? I'll speak for myself. What do I want? Why I'm an entrepreneur? Because I want control. I feel powerless. 
I felt in out of not in control. So I sought control of my destiny. I, I don't know what human doesn't want control at some degree, whether they have chosen to be an owner of a business or chosen to be a, s- s- highly competent within the context of someone else's business. But like, what percentage so me, of people are cut out for that? Well, I, I, I guess, what do you mean by that? Right. It's like, what, you know, that if, if you mean by that, you mean the opportunity to serve oneself through something one, you know, deems themselves worthy of doing for another, whether that be folding napkins for someone and getting paid the only fans, the Uber, the Lyft, helping people get their home, a processor. Well, I would hope everybody's cut out for that. I, I went more in terms what do you of mean, the, yeah. when you said about the entrepreneurial side of the ability to express that through being independent and not having to work for some jerk. And I'm well, my curiosity that. is what is the implications of our culture of everyone feel everyone like people like all of us feeling and then being at a feeling it more in control because of our information gathering like the home buyers that call you they've already looked on zillow so they feel more in control and they're more in control so it's emotional psychological and it's and it's arguably literal like they have more information that's all of us we all have more information so we're, we're, we're psychologically more in control in the sense that we feel subjectively more in control than arguably technologically based on what well, we have the money, we're the consumer, the, the things are starting to tip in our favor. So ultimately we have more control. Now, control is a big piece of that entrepreneurial gene in the sense that the entrepreneur, the self-starter, they don't just yearn for control and feel in control they quite literally are in control. They, they control the cash flow. They control who works and who doesn't. Now, what if the whole, what if by and large our entire culture that yearns for control without whether they're aware of it or not has more of it psychologically and is in more control literally yet is not fundamentally this may be in response to what you said how many how many are like are that right but it's not or how many responsible uh, enough for that control i guess you could you know or 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 ultimately i think we underestimate people generally meaning how much they'll actually work for themselves right so that same person that is in our office that we think is a totally a victim we know who we think we know who they voted for. We think they're just totally a waste of space. A lot of times they end up like that person. I've seen it. They end up going and outshining the master. Sure. <laughs> you know, at one point I was somebody's uh, joke of a of an employee or, or or a mentee. Maybe maybe the same for you. So so I think like I don't know. It's just an maybe we underestimate how much people are actually working and producing for themselves. And it's hard. It must be really hard to track all of that. I don't know. Well, I, you, the last thing you just said. So, yeah, I mean, I will just on the one point you made, I'll say that while I may generalize about, you know, broadly about people, right? Like I always, I'm actually somebody that always on an individual level, I want to see the best in people. I want to believe in them specifically to the role that I do of, trying to have my team, you know, evolve and grow and learn and become better and reach their goals. So, you know, it's funny. It's like, I might be so cynical when it comes broad to the generation or to workers or things like that. But then on the individual level, you know, I, I always try to see the, uh, you know, I think, see that, see that anybody could, could be anything that they want to be if they put their mind down to it. But um, you know, I, yes, I would say that it's, I it just, just on that final point of, of that, there is a certain level of response. So if, if people just, we've, we're in a culture now with social media that paints this to this glory, to be this glorious thing, that makes it out to be this glorious thing. And all of these things that resonate within people of having control, you know, be, you know, of your destiny and, and all of, all of the freedoms and things that can come with it. 
but you know as well as I know all of the sacrifice and the discipline and the ups and downs that can come with it. And I do think that's, I do think it's a problem um, that it's shown, I think, so much of one side. And I don't think everybody um, is either cut out or even if you say that they are cut out or could be cut out, that there's just everybody is prepared for that because we've we've uh, made it so sexy and so exciting and whatever that, you know. So let's say that they're not. Let's say I agree with you. But what if the median income rose at a percentage, at a reasonable percentage, just because the average employee type person, they're never going to be, you know, bajillionaire. They just have more control of when they can work and how they can work. So yeah, but real incomes like dropped. They didn't rise. <laughs> so well, I guess. But my curiosity is: does does that get tracked? Could that be tracked? Ah, that, 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 that brings, like yeah. if my re, if if the average if it depends how they track. I have no idea. But let's say if the, if we're tracking income based on jobs, how do we ever? How could we possibly track the gig economy? And if that raised the average person, like you know median income by 20%, well, then couldn't we theoretically get to wage? Whatever you said earlier was really interesting to me. When the wages go up, so the income of wage price goes spiral. Up, the prices go up, yeah. because I got all this extra money from my OnlyFans, I don't give a crap about spending another 20 bucks at the thing. Like I bought a, I bought a Celsius at a hotel for an event the other day. And after I tipped, I generally tip. That's a whole nother thing. Everything asks for a tip, even if they do nothing. And the likelihood of someone not tipping is very low because of the guilt factor. So, so by the end of it, I mean, I put a dollar in the tray then I tip 20%. By the end of it, my Celsius is $21. I'm thinking, what just happened? So, so <laughs> now, now if, if I'm a, an Uber driver, from if I have a full time job from eight a.m. to five, I do Uber from five to eight thirty p.m. and I do OnlyFans from eight thirty p.m. to nine fifteen. I mean, I'm I'm pretty. My curiosity is is the government tracking my Uber and my OnlyFans? And if well, the answer is no, oh, I might a, be buying Celsius twenty one dollars every day, and that could be so. I don't that's know. A, Questions that came to mind after this very thought-provoking, well-articulated conversation. I think we should leave a cliffhanger for the audience and have you on maybe maybe soon uh, to finish this conversation and see if we're all still alive in the next 30 days from the SVP. <laughs> well, I think the we'll be alive. Is in your court, right, brother, like final thought on this, whatever you want to say, you want to respond to that. No, I, I just, I think it's a great idea because yeah, I think there's so much more we could get into, but uh, to, to, to get on again, if you'd like, but yes, I, I think your final point was actually, well, as I thought about it um, is, you know, when I say that real incomes have, have fallen, right. It's, uh, it's what you track, right. And if more people are doing gig and more people are being self-employed now, once these 86,000 uh, IRS agents get on board, we'll maybe get a better look at uh, how much the real incomes are rising. Uh, but for now, that would be very difficult to track. And uh, it could be that incomes are much higher. And that's putting the I, that, that I was definitely going to say that, that broadly speaking, that if nothing else, this makes it much more difficult to get a clear picture of what's going on, because there's all of these things that have changed They've changed the game a little bit and made it a little harder to read the tea leaves than it would have. That's what past. scares me about the current administration based on not because I have some issue with, with them philosophically or politically, but because based on my study of the philosophies and the political purviews, I mean, maybe they have an idea that, hey, we got to keep going because we live in 2023 and we think it's meta. Like, you know, I mean, it's just something I think about. We may be too rational or, or right, because Schopenhauer says, said, every, 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 every person limits the, their vision of the, wait, every person's limits the, their view of the world by the limits of their vision. 
so I'm, I'm messing the quote up. Every, we, vi we, we, we limit the vision, our, our understanding of the world, you know, by our own vision. So there's so like a lot of saying, rational people. So the, these, the, these, these uh, are, uh, are you saying that our, uh, our benevolent uh, leaders uh, have more vision than us and so therefore are able to foresee things that we're not able to foresee? Well, well, I think we all think that in, in, in one degree or another of ourselves, whether we're aware of it or not. So I don't know if we can discount whatever philosophies are underlining the, the, the people that are pulling the lever. That's my, you know, I wonder how, 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 um, yeah, just something to think about. I don't know, final, final thoughts before we wrap up here, brother. No, this is awesome, Jay. It's always great to get together and kick, kick around. Uh... You know, I feel like we spent a lot of time on the housing and the other stuff, and then we started getting into some other exciting things, but I could talk with you forever. So um hope some folks find some value in this and um happy to do it anytime with you, man. I always enjoy it. Thank you, brother. Thank you all for listening. And we will see you next time on the Culture Matters podcast.